Hello, everyone. Let's welcome our next speaker to the stage. Uh, he needs a little introduction because most of you probably know him. He's not someone new to the stage. Uh, he's been here many times. Not only here, he was a speaker on many, many, many conferences, both Bulgarian and international. Uh, he's going to talk today about uh, building or buying your software. Niki Stuitsev. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Niki, and today I'm going to talk about building and buying software. Um, I'm an engineering manager at Halo Diagnostics. We are a software company that is creating software for uh, advanced medical diagnosis of uh, medical um, problems that people are having. Um, so let me, let me start by asking a question. How many of you work in an organization that can develop software by a show of hands? <laughs> of everybody, right? And we are all working in such companies. We know how to uh, evaluate requirements, write code, uh, test it, ship it to production. This is something that we know very well. This is what we're doing, right? We are um, engineers. We're working in technology. We like to build new things. And every time when we have a problem, we all love the feeling of having a black blank page in front of us, right? We know that we can start from scratch. We know that we can uh, use the frameworks that we like or the frameworks that we want to learn. Uh, we know that we can put the best practices that we like or the best practices that we want to learn. The architecture it is something that still needs to be figured out and it's lovely, it's awesome, right? We have this opportunity to solve something from scratch. But every time when we have a problem to solve and we think about, okay, let's start, let's solve it from, I'm gonna write it from the beginning and uh, yeah, it's gonna be something new. There is always the alternative to look what, softwares ex what software exists out there um, and use something that's already made. Um, and every time when we even think about it, there are a couple of things that make people hesitant. So the first thing is that people are saying, okay, we can get some third-party software and use it, but it's not gonna fit in our um, environment. We're some kind of special, we have these special constraints um, that come from the environment where we operate, or in these situations that we are currently at, um, the third-party software is not actually going to work. Um, Another thing that stops people from using third-party software is them saying, well, it's actually not invented here, so most probably the code is not following our best practices in terms of how code should be written, or um, we're not sure how, we, how it's going to integrate with our monitoring infrastructure, or we're not sure how we're going to deploy it. Do we need to deploy it? It's going to be a SaaS type of thing. It's not invented here, so third-party software will be hard to, hard to fit in our architecture. Or there's always these existential questions. Uh, basically, we're engineers, we're supposed to build things, and the, the industry is very good at telling us uh, how to build software in a good way, but there is little knowledge, not that much, uh, basically, tendency over integrating software. And every time when we're like, well, I'm gonna integrate something, something, some other component that somebody else wrote, and I'm not gonna employ my engineering skills to the best. Am I, in this case, am I really an engineer? I'm getting some, something that's already there and just plugging it. And these are, these are good questions, right? Uh, so at the end of the day, we, we ask ourselves, okay, why do we even, why do we should even consider it? Why do, there are so many things that make people hesitant. Why, why do we even are going to consider buying something instead of building everything ourselves? Um, and the first thing that I'm going to mention is something called an opportunity cost. So basically, every time when you're solving a problem, you're not solving another problem. So if your engineers are working on something, or if, if you're working on something that is not part of your core value that you deliver to your users, um, then um, you're, not, you're not solving the most impact, impactful thing. And you're using, losing the opportunity to work on the most impactful thing, when you're not working on the most impactful thing. Um, and I'm gonna use an example. Imagine that you're in the business of building houses. 
so every time you need to ask yourself, okay, am I in the building of building houses or I'm in the business of building the nails, uh, the bricks, the electric switches, the, the lightning bulbs, and everything that goes into a, into a home. Um, basically, you need to ask yourself, okay, what is the value that I'm bringing? Am I working on a thing that I'm supposed to work on? If not, then, uh, yeah, you, you should focus on the thing that, that matter. Um, so basically, if we get all the features in the world that it can implement, that we can work on, and these include the business features um, that, that, that are there, it, it includes also the engineering features, basically everything, all the uh, components that, that we need to build to create, and we sort them by the value of custom, value they give to the customers, and on the horizontal axis we just put the feature, they're going to look something like this, right? In descending order, there are some features that bring a lot of value, and the, it, they're sorted by value, so it decreases over time. And somewhere out there, there is a cutting line when uh, that, that says, okay, the value that, that we're investing to work on something over here doesn't just justify the value that it's going to bring to the customers. Basically, we're, um, the things on the right are the things that uh, if we focus on them, we're not bringing that much value to the customers than working on the things on the left. Um, so yeah, we should always think about it and focus on the things that are available to the customers and to, in the things that basically our time is worth investing in, uh, where our efforts bring the uh, value that is, it is, is positive. Um, there's also another thing that building something internally, unless you have a big scale, um, it is it's often more expensive than buying it ready-made. Um, and even for the things that we consider expensive, if you compare it to hiring people, paying them salaries, uh, so they can work on this thing, uh, it's often cheaper to, to buy it ready-made than to spend the time to integrate it and not have a team working on it, but have a team that works on something that's more, more impactful. And there's also... Uh, the thing about faster time to market. So sometimes you know that there's something that you need to build. It's going to be super awesome if you're going to build it. Uh, it's part of your core competencies, but you want to deploy your product in front of customers quicker so they can start playing it, with it, using it, giving you feedback. Um, and in this case, you want faster time to market. Then buying is something that accelerates your uh, time it takes to basically deploy your software in front of real real users. And uh, create, so we see that there are some situations where it, where it makes sense to get software that's already made. Um, and we, we of, we, there are some problems that people very often face when, when integrating with such software. And sometimes when we start start jumping to integration and we start scratching our head and basically like, okay, pff, it's super tedious to, uh, to do this integration. Um, it's very inefficient. Um, and yeah, there are some problems that people often face when integrating third, third party software. Um, and the first problem is underestimating the integration. Um, this is something that people very often suffer from. And I can give an example up here, so um, we were evaluating different softwares for uh, one component in our system, and we were like, okay, there is this super customizable software over here that can, f it looks like you can customize it to do almost anything that, that we need to solve any corner case that we have. But basically very customizable third, third party solution that we can just get, customize it and and put it to solve our problem. But then, the yeah, we started talking more with the company, and they were like, yeah, but typical integration is taking two years. Just because it's so customizable that you basically need to do so many customizations um, that it usually takes two years. Uh, or another example, uh, we had to, in, in one of my, in my previous teams, we had to integrate with uh, REST API. And the REST API that a lot of other companies have already integrated with. 
And we were like, okay, it's just an API. We write the client, request response, super easy, right? But what we didn't know is that the API, it's in Hungarian. <laughs> and all the companies that integrate with the software are Hungarian companies. The documentation is in Hungarian, and the, basically the parameters that are there are in Hungarian, and we couldn't actually figure out what we need to do, and we were not able to do the integration. Um, so one common mistake that people have, people do, is underestimating the integration. Another mistake that people have uh, to do is over customizing their code to in, to fit with the third party software that that is there. And a very good example that I've seen here in the past is basically when you need to do payments and you integrate with some payment system, you start writing the code that is working with the payment system. Basically, you're building your billing module and you're uh, basically building your billing module so customized to the third-party system that is processing the payments, that it becomes the worst of both worlds. <laughs> so basically, you have a lot of code that you write on your own uh, that, that's like uh, very tied to the, to the third-party system that's there. You also have a third-party system that you don't have much control over, um, and it creates a lot of technical depth and limits your, your uh, basically, yeah, your, your, your ability uh, both to innovate and to take advantage of the fact that you have ac actually bought something and not build it from scratch. Um, and then third uh, pitfall that people fall into is evaluating every option out there for every decision that they're making. So every time when we need to see if there is something out there that can solve our problem so we don't have to solve it ourselves, it's like taking forever. We're looking at all the vendors, and then we're requesting trial periods with all the vendors, and there are five, six emails with each sales representative um, or people from, from the team on the other end, and then there are one, two demos, and it's taking forever, and people are like, yeah, it's taking too much time, so we, we're not gonna bother it. Um, yeah, this happens when you're not doing it very efficiently. Um, and yeah, so there are some problems that, that you, you should avoid, uh, but then the Question comes, okay, uh, we know that there are some situations when I can buy some software, not build it, not build it by myself. Um, I know that there are some pitfalls that I can avoid. The next question is, okay, how should I pick what components are suitable for building internally, what components are suitable for buying? And in order to make these decisions, you need to have some form of strategy. You need to have some long-term plan, basically a way to see what's the environment that you're working in and be able to make decisions based on the environment, based on the um, state of your product, based on um, the, all the constraints that you're having and that's forward looking. That basically can be actual strategy so you can make decisions based on your strategy. And uh, before going into the strategy, there are three key principles um, that if if you answer yes to some of the, those questions, then you don't need a strategy, there are principles, and you should go ahead and uh, build it or buy it. So the first question that you want to ask yourself is, is it core to the business? Is the thing that I'm uh, designing right now, the thing that will bring most value to the users, the, things that, the thing that this product is actually trying to solve? If it's core to your business, then you want to be able to innovate faster, uh, make changes, do the innovation that you want to do, and in this case, you need to basically build it, right? Um, the other principle is, do you need to change it regularly? Um, is it something that you want to iterate on? Basically, if you uh, constantly collect feedback on this functionality that you're addressing with your component, and you want to constantly evolve it in any direction, third-party software is going to put some restrictions uh, either on the pace of, pace of change or either in limitations of the di directions that you can take. And if you need to change something regularly, then it's better to build it. To build it. And also, if it needs to adapt to changes quickly, so um, if, you, if your context changes and you need to react on the, con the changing of your context, and this needs to happen fast, it will be very hard to do it with a third-party software because if it's, you need to change it in a direction that the third-party system doesn't support, 
then what? You need to find another vendor that's going to take time and integrate with it. That's going to take time. So if you have parts of your system when reacting to changes quickly is super important, then it's not a good idea to buy third-party third software. And uh, there is one super useful tool when it comes to, to strategy, and it's called uh, Wardly Map. Basically, it helps us um, the, draft the value stream of our product that we're building, the components, how they interact with each other, the dependency between the components, and what stage of evolution uh, the components are. And it looks super simple. So you have horizontal axis, uh, where you have the value that is visible to the to the users or uh, some things that are invisible. So th the most user-facing features and user interfaces sit on top of the map, and your infrastructure sits in, in the bottom. So think about your databases, your deployment infrastructure, your data infrastructure, uh, observability infrastructure, basically all the things that are not visible to the user but, but are important sit on the bottom. Um, and then we have different stages where each component uh, can be at. There are Genesis custom build, product, and custom. The first stage that uh, a component can be in is the Genesis phase. This is where you just discovered something, um, you're not sure if, if it's the right thing, you experiment a lot with it, it's new, it's, new, it's unique, you haven't seen it somewhere else before, um, and yeah, com components in this phase are unique and yeah, and are still in the genesis phase. Then we have the custom build phase. In the custom build phase, is something that okay, we know that it solves a problem. Um, we know that it's a viable problem. Does the solution kind of work? So it's time to build it to fit in our environment. But it's still built to fit in our environment. It's custom built. It's still uncommon, and you're still learning about the components that sit in this vertical. Um, then you have the product phase. In the product phase, you can take the component from one environment, put it in another environment. It's going to be uh, still be, be able to be used. Uh, the things in the product phase are things that are common and things that, that are better understood than the things on the previous phases. Um, and then you have a commodity phase where something is highly standardized and you know how to get it, you know how to operate it, and when something is in the commodity phase, the focus there is on making it more efficient, uh, making it easier to operate, and basically improvements. And component, component, the components that you're building goes through all those phases. So you start, start with Genesis, when it's something new, and it moves all, all the way to commodity, commodity, when it becomes something that's so applicable in the industry, it's like something that's very easy to find very easy to use. And uh, this picture is very different for, for the different companies. So let's get electricity, for example. So electricity, for our company, we are a medical diagnosis company, right? And electricity for, for us is a commodity. But if you are a renewable energy startup, then maybe your solution for electricity is in the genesis phase. Um, and yeah, it's different depending on the environment where you're uh, team is, and uh, yeah, basically it gives the those four evolution stages. And I'm going to show you how to build such a map for yourself, so you can uh, make the, make the decisions that you need to be able to make. First, you always start with your users, and I pick just one of our users. We have like 20 personas that we uh, need to build software for. Um, but the patient is like something that's more relatable. All of us have been to, uh, to yeah, medical facilities. Uh, and we know, yeah, basically patient is something that people can relate. So first you put your users on the top. And then you ask yourself, okay, what are the needs of my users? Basically you define the user's needs. And let's say that we have a patient that wants to get um, MRI of their uh, knee, for example, because, because they had a football injury. What, what, do, what does the patient need? They need to be able to schedule. They need to be able to call and say, okay, can I come next Wednesday morning in 10 a.m.? And there needs to be some, somebody on the other end to receive the call and put the appointment in the calendar. Then they need to know how to prepare for the exam. Uh, for example, 
they need to know not to wear any metal parts, um, they need to know to wear comfortable clothes, they, they need to, to know if their uh, medical devices that they have are suitable for this type of exams. Basically, they need to be prepared for the things that are going to happen. And they need to be able to go and actually get their knee scanned. So they need a scan. Then in order to continue to build them up, uh, we think about, OK, what are the things that are needed for these core needs to be set satisfied? And we, again, identify some more components. Basically, in order to do the scheduling, you need a calendar. And uh, our calendar is something that we have customly built. That's why it's in custom build phase. Um, then we have EHR, is Electronic Healthcare Record System. That's basically a system that stores patient information. It's something that's yeah, well-defined, well-understood. Everybody in the industry, where they, when they hear the term EHR, they know, they know what people are talking about, what to expect, how to work with it, what functionality is there. Um, and then we also have SMS notifications, which is like something that we use out of the box in, or, in order to be able to send the information to the patient and send them, hey, tomorrow you're having your knee scanned. Don't forget not, not to wear any metal parts on your body, wear comfortable clothes. Um, and then we need the modality, which is like the machine where people sit in and get the picture of their knee, um, the MRI image of their knee, uh, which is the MRI machine. And for this is something that we, yeah, there are a lot of MRI machines that we can pick from and buy. And yeah, for, for this is a commodity. Uh, and then you continue further on. Um, so in order to be able to get the pictures, move them to our data centers, um, we need some solutions that is moving files between uh, the machines and our data center. They're like super large files. The smallest one is like 300 megabytes. There is special protocol. Um, then this picture needs to go to a doctor's computer so a doctor can open it and see what they see and be able to say, okay, the knee is fine or there's some problem with the knee. And all this transfer needs to happen. The image needs to go from the modality, it needs to go to our data center, then to the doctor's computer. Um, and this is why we have this component called ITL. Patient don't know about it, don't care about it. That's why it's in the bottom. It's something that doesn't exist in the industry, uh, strangely enough. It's something that we are still learning about. That's why it's in the genesis phase. And then we have a viewer that's like the program that the doctors are using to view the image, rotate it, do some change the, con the contrast, uh, do some fancy stuff with it. And then we have a same system called PAX, which is like uh, storage for images. Um, and again, these are products. If you ask any doctor, hey, open the viewer, they know what to open. They know how to work with it. Or the doctors also know what PAX is uh, because they, yeah, they're bothered by, by it frequently. So again, it's a product that's well adopted in the industry. And what, once we have this picture, uh, there is a way to say, okay, here are the components that I'm gonna buy, and here are the components that I'm gonna build. So for us, the, for example, calendar, there are a lot of calendars out there that we can use, but we want to do a lot of optimizations on top of it, and checks, and predictions on certain things. Uh, it's very custom in order to make it efficient, in order for more patients to be able to uh, get good quality diagnosis. And then we also have this image transfer thing. It's something that we're building because it's something that we're in innovating in, um, something that's actually very important in order to make the other things that we want to do happen. Um, this is why, yeah, it's something that we're building. But, for, but for example, the machines that are taking images, we're not in this business, so it's something that we're buying. The SMS notifications, not really a core thing. We can see that they're in the community phase. It's, there are a lot of providers. We know, we know that there is a REST API to send SMS messages. We can find third-party system that sends messages and use it. Uh, Viewer and packs are interesting because they are both things that um, are very related to the things that the company is doing. And we want to be able to innovate in those spaces but in order to get faster time to market, to be able to deploy the whole solution from the end to end faster to the users, we're buying them in this hypothetical scenario. And there are, so 
you, you can see that by having this picture, knowing the stage of the evolution of your components, how they depend on each other, you can make informed decisions about those building and buying decisions. And it also uh, helps you to do other kind of, other kind of decisions. Um, so let, let's say that you have built something, some product, and let's say EHR, for example, electronic healthcare record system. You have built this system that stores patient information, um, and you want to evolve it further. Basically, you want to move it to make it a commodity. It's something that's uh, well understood. It will be good for your company, if, and then for the uh, broader ecosystem um, to have a standardized EHR and to make it more accessible for uh, other people to use your awesome software that, that's helping them solve a problem. And you may decide, okay, let's open source it. And by open sourcing it well, this means uh, Maintaining it, maintaining it regularly, uh, having good uh, training materials, make it easier for people to contribute, support active community, all the things that are good open source product is trying to have, if you do them well, the community is gonna embrace it. And open sourcing some, something oh, very often helps you move it from one stage to the next. Um, for example, if you have something custom built and you open source it and you allow other people to apply it in their environments, and again, you need to not just put the code out there, but you need to open source it in the, in the, in the way that uh, the good open source projects are run. Um, but yeah, having a long-term commitment, supporting the community, um, doing all the things like documentation, onboarding training materials, learning materials, um, if you do those things well, then your custom build thing, maybe somebody is gonna get it, contribute to it so it can be applied to their environment, and contribution by contribution is gonna move from custom build to product phase. Um, and same with, with Genesis, you may say, okay, I'm not sure if this is gonna solve a problem or anybody's problem, so I can open source it, ask the people's, other people's opinion, and then somebody can jump in, start applying it somewhere, and it goes from Genesis to custom build phase. So open source is, a, op, deciding to open source something is again part of your strategy, and yeah, this mapping can help you make those decisions. Um, oops, I skipped the site. Okay, so now that we know that there are situations where buying software makes sense, uh, we know how to make those decisions. We know what to be aware of. Then we're saying, okay, we want to buy an Apple. But then the question is, which Apple? <laughs> Basically, how to pick uh, the software that's gonna help solve your problem the best way or the more efficient way. There's so many different kinds of Apples, green Apples, red Apples, orange Apples. Um, and basically, you need to make a good process in order to pick and integrate with third-party software. And you're always starting by making a wish list. So you sit down and you start to think, okay, what are the features that I want my software to be able to do? What are the critical features? What are the deal breakers? If this feature is not supported, it's, yeah, it's absolutely no way we can work with this software. Then what are nice to have, good to have? Basically, you make a wish list, you, you prioritize it. Um, um, one thing that you need to keep in mind is there that there will be missing features. So there will be some features on your wish list that no software out there is gonna be able to cover 100% of your wishes and be and cover your needs by 100%. But this is not what we are looking for here, right? We are either looking for most uh, cost-effective way to solve a problem, or we are lo looking for a faster time to market. So you need to know that there will be missing feature. There is not this magical software out there that's gonna solve 100% of your needs. And you need to be, yeah, you need to have a strategy how to mitigate it. Are you gonna write some custom code? Are you gonna just live, just live your life without having those features? You need to, yeah, you need to be prepared that you need, you, you need to make those decisions. And another thing to be aware of is that you're never gonna have a perfect picture. In the perfect world, you're gonna have infinite time, infinite resources. Um, 
you will be able to contact every vendor out there, ask them for a trial period, they will respond quickly, uh, they will give you accounts and you write some code to try to integrate with the third party software. And this is gonna take a lot of time. And it's also still is not gonna give you a perfect picture. Even, even if you spend this time and you write some code, unless you implement the whole thing, you're not gonna know what are the, are there some hidden things, corner cases that you haven't thought of, uh, haven't discussed with, with the company. Um, so yeah, you should know that you should never have a, per you will never have a perfect picture of the landscape. But what you're aiming for is good enough picture in a reasonable time. And okay, we have our list of vendors. We built this score sheet uh, where we have the features and we have um, our vendors. And ultimately, the feature list should be with yes and no, uh, and yes and no answers because this would make it easier for your uh, decision making. But sometimes <laughs> it's inevitable. We don't live in a perfect world. Uh, maybe some feature is partially supported or uh, some vendor doesn't support the feature, but they're saying, well, we don't support the, we don't have this feature, but we have this extension mechanism that if you take advantage of, you can build the missing thing yourself. Um, and here is the doc documentation how to use this extension point. And then it's, yeah, they don't have it, but it's possible for us to have this feature if we extend, extend, it, in our, extend it ourselves. Um, so yeah, you have the vendors, you have the features that are out there, and um, you build this course sheet that allows you to make a decision. Um, and here are some example considerations to put on your um, score sheet. So first is the company information. For example, where is the company operating? Uh, where are they physically storing the user's data, the data that you're, uh, that you're producing or sending them? because you may have some restrictions or where, in which countries the data can live depending on the regulations. Um, then you want to check the company financial information. Uh, if it's a well-established company with huge track record um, and basically in good financial condition, it's different than integrating with a pre-seed startup that doesn't even have uh, a support team, for example, or they have six months of runaway. Uh, and yeah, basically you also need to check the company financial information. Then you care about the list of features. You also obviously care about pricing. And over here you need to uh, think about, yeah, is it, does it justify the price that we're gonna pay? Um, what is the pricing model? Is, is it the licensing model? Price basically paper use or what yeah basically what how's the pricing working and then you have different risks that you uh, want to think about uh, for example there is reputational risks uh, if there is a vendor that doesn't have a good reputation and you integrate with this company uh, then your reputation is going to suffer um, there's a security risk basically what is the third party company security standards? How are they, they ensuring those standards? And there's also the operational risk. Uh, what happens if their system is down? Do we have a clear escalation path? Uh, what is their SLA? Is it uh, in, aligned with our SLA? And there are those operational risks that you need to, to think about. And um, another, yeah, after you have picked your vendor, you have worked with the vendor, there is something called vendor management that is like super important. And if you're working in a big company, there'll be like a vendor management team, They're, they'll take care of negotiating the contract, vetting the vendor, there'll be security team that's gonna do security evaluation, they, they're gonna check their standards, they're gonna maybe run a pen test. Uh, and in big companies, we have a whole suite of teams that are taking care of vendor management. But if you're in a smaller company, you need to take this thing into a, an account. That basically, you will have to negotiate the contract. And when it expires, you will have to rene renegotiate it. Um, and you're going to start Googling things like rene renegotiating contracts. 
uh, how to do it and what are the leverages that, leverages that you can use. Uh, but vendor management is something super important and if you integrate with another company, you need to um, do it, basically if you're in a, in a small company, you need to do it yourself to know who are the people on the other end that you can uh, reach out to, to know when the contract is expiring and to Google how to renegotiate vendor contracts when they expire and stuff like that. Something to take into an account. Then in a smaller setup, you're gonna do it, you need to do it yourself. In a bigger company, there will be a lot of teams that uh, are there to hold your hand and guide you in the process and help you make uh, those integrations easier. And that's great, but you can still say, okay, I can build this map, I can make the decisions about buying something because I know that it makes sense from our strategy point of view. Uh, but our company doesn't buy, buy software, right? I'm going to propose it to my manager, uh, they're going to propose it to their manager. Um, how to start? Basically, our company doesn't have the habit, doesn't, we don't have the culture of um, working with so much with third party companies. Basically, okay, I know that it's better to solve a problem by by integrating with external software, I know how to do it, I know how to make the decision, but how to start, my company doesn't do it. Um, and my tip here for you is start with some small experiment. So uh, let's say that you're spending a lot of effort on maintaining your own monitoring infrastructure, so you know when your systems are running fine, which includes uh, tracing, logging, monitoring, uh, all the things that, that you need to, to run yourself. And one op option will be to go to your manager and say, well, let's replace our whole monitoring infrastructure with this third party system over here. And this is like a big change if you propose it, they'll be like, well, very hesitant because they already made the decisions to build it internally. They already, there are people working on it. So imagine that you go to them and you say, well, do you want to use this system instead of the thing that you're doing? Uh, it would be very hard to convince, to uh, make the case from start on that uh, what you're proposing is the, the correct part. So what you can do is pick something small. So pick one component that you're working on day to day. Uh, do, do your thing like, um, so think about, okay, is, is this something that's part of our core com competencies? If you're a monitoring company that's selling monitoring service to other uh, companies, then it's obviously this is the product that you're building. But if you're not, if you're making a product, then this is something that, that, you, that you're just using yeah, to more efficiently operate it, or to operate it at all. Um, then it's not part of your core things. It makes sense to build it. You know how to draw, to draw the diagram, make make the decision based on the strategy. Um, and you say, okay, it makes sense. Go try, try some vendor, select a vendor. And when you select, select a vendor, try to integrate it with, in your piece of service that you're owning or your component that you're owning. Um, and try, try, try to, get, to get some examples, some numbers. Essentially build a case. And in building a case, there are a couple of things that you need to think about. First is get testimonials. So you in instrument your service, for example, with this third-party instrumentation for monitoring, and then you ask your teammates, well, is it easier to use this thing or is it easier to use the in-house thing? Um, and then get, get, get some numbers. For example, um, it's not it's not less efficient to uh, troubleshoot outages, for example, or it's more efficient, or it's less efficient to uh, find logs, but it's but it's easier for me to find metrics and traces, for example. Uh, basically, you need you build a case by measuring stuff and collecting testimonials, and then you go and propose the, this case and to to your to your manager and and like okay, I, they most probably know that you have spent all this time. Uh, so, so you're saying to them, okay, here is the case. Um, it makes sense to use the third-party software for this because it's making, uh, it has disadvantages, it has these disadvantages, the advantages um, way over on the disadvantages. And there is a case for us to, to basically move to a third-party solution. Um, and then, yeah, 
you may be you may decide to okay let's try it in our area not in the whole company but in our area you try it in the area it works then you build it yeah it makes the case for a bigger organizations to switch to it and eventually maybe the whole company and yeah so as a summary every time when you're making a, a solution a decision to build something from scratch to solve a problem always you need to know that you can buy something and integrate it um, think about opportunity cost and time to market. Sometimes it makes sense to build it, sometimes it makes sense to buy it. So think about opportunity cost, time to market, things that you want to optimize for. Um, beware of the pitfalls when integrating with third party software. Um, have a strategy, draw your map, make it, uh, make, a, make other, other people in the company know about it, use it. Basically have a strategy that's shared. Um, and then last, my last point is that vendor management is super important. You need to think about it. You need to um, be something that's part of your uh, workflow for for solving problems when you have a third-party solution. And uh, yeah, every time you can build something, you can buy something, you should be aware of those options, think about them, and yeah, build the best thing that you can do. Thank you very much, and I'm looking for the for your questions. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, if you have some questions, we ha still have some time. The mic is yours. Uh, it's in the middle of the room. Or if you're shy for some reason, uh, you can always speak with Nikki outside in the speaker's corner. Yes? So you can be for international audience. Uh, can you shortly uh, systematize the, uh, what you wanted to say? It means that when uh, paid software went open source, because yesterday I had have some short presentation in writing talks that say that part of the um, open source should be forbidden by law. And uh, part of the open source, uh, which should not be forbidden, is made by big companies like a Gift or like for their own interest. Uh, because uh, open source made by communities, 99.9% uh, made by some people that may be programmers, may be coders, but don't understand the core of the problem. Uh, so for that reason, I would like just to briefly uh, say, and many people right now, which I try to spread the open source, say, oh, go to hell with your open source. A paid software uh, is uh, targeting, uh, you have to who to claim, and you cannot claim to community, etc. So um, let's just yeah. more detail it because. Yeah, that's a very good point. So when when something is open source, doesn't mean that it's free, right? We all know free in terms of speech, not free in terms of beers. Um, and every yeah, every time when you're uh, part of an open, when you're using open source products, right? Open source tools, you're part of the community, and it's very important to be able to contribute to to, to the community, right? Either financially or by writing code. Um, and most open, most, most open source projects that are widely adopted in the industry has also paid support that companies often use. Um, so this is, yeah, th this is one point. That some, when something is open source doesn't mean that it's free. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of open source projects there, as, as you say, they're of a different quality. Um, the, but the, yeah, the most, and you're right that a lot of big companies uh, have very successful open source projects. Um, and this is, this is part of their, this is due, due to the strategy that they're having. So uh, when you think about the product evolution, one of the points that I shared with you during the talk was that it, by open sourcing something, you move it from one stage to the next. Uh, so let's say that you're, you're Google, you have this in, internal, way of uh, running hardware, deploying stuff on your compute nodes, managing storage. And it's already 
something that you're using very well and you want to be able to run it even more efficiently. And then what, what you do? Well, you can open source your approach, aka Kubernetes, uh, but do it in a nice way. You know, basically, build a community around it. You can see how many Kubernetes talks there are today and yesterday on, on, the, on the conference. Um, and yeah, so big companies make those decisions in order to be able to um, move the, the evolution of their products further on and further on, and in order to be able to contribute something to the to the ecosystem, right? Because this is also very important. Okay, someone else. We still have a couple of seconds, so. Oh, hi. Thanks. Uh, this was really fun to, to listen to. Um, I want to ask you, because uh, you said open sourcing something helps you move it forward from left to right to commodify. There's also another way to commodify, and I'm curious what's your idea on which path you choose. You can also commodify by, into, like, by expanding your business model, in a sense. Yeah. So you talked about EHR. You can open source your EHR solution. Or you can do EHR as a service and start selling that to other companies that would use it. How would yeah. you approach making a decision between the two? Can you combine the two somehow? Yeah, because yeah. you said free speech and free beer. Yeah, of course. So again, this needs to be part of your strategy. So um, if you're saying, well, EHR, if let's say all, all the companies in healthcare start to use the, our open source EHR, and it's very nicely integrates with the rest of our ecosystem. It will be very easy for them to um, send patients for us for diagnosis, for example. And this is more like a business solution that that you need to make, uh, which is and basically it's like which is more likely for you to open source the thing because you have a very good understanding of how to well open source it and to get it adopted by the market or you have a very strong sales and marketing teams that are going to be able to sell uh, this, soft, this software. Um, in both cases, it needs to be to have all the features. It needs to be a very nicely built product in terms of user experience, solving the right needs. In order for people to use it, no matter if it's open source or uh, as a service model, then yeah, it needs to solve the problem in a very good way. So this is always needs to be, but then you need to Ask yourself what are the competencies that you can lean more towards. If you have the, the stronger engineering team that I like, can pull off open sourcing it in a nice way, and then you have the developer relations function that you, if you even if you don't have it, you know how to build it, how to run it, and you, and yeah, this is one option. Another option is okay, we can actually sell it as a service. We have this awesome product. Uh, we have this amazing sales marketing team that's gonna help the product reach so many people in the industry and uh, convince them to use it, then you basically these are the two options that, that you can you pick. And yeah, open sourcing is yeah another, another thing that the people, so components can move from left to right, uh, but they can also move from left to right to left. If, for example, if you patent something, then you basically <laughs> put constraint on it, right? And uh, yeah, other, other companies cannot take advantage of it and yeah, move it further on down, down the line. You need to push it yourself. So yeah, if it's patent or a trade secret, then you go to the route of as a service. If it's something that is not patented, tra trade secret, um, then you go in, in the other, other direction. And patent is basically you don't want some uh, patent show to sue you for your EHR just because they wrap up some dusty patent from, from somewhere. Um, and yeah. Thank you. And uh, we are done with our time. You can always speak with Nikki outside and also in the speaker's corners over there. So let's hear your round of applause for him. <laughs>